Hello and welcome to Dancers. I'm very excited for this episode. We have an interview with my good friend, Laura Peak. I am a little tired right now. I'm going to share the story of why I'm tired, which is, by the way, against my best interest. This story is not going to paint me in the best light, but I thought I would share it because it's human. Oh, I forgot. Please subscribe to the podcast. But anyway, um, last night I was at an open mic and my friends got up really early that I was there with and I went up really late and it was midnight. I'm really tired. I get on stage. There are six people in the audience, right? I've done worse than that. I've done a mic with one person in the audience and it's the host of the mic, right? So this is not new territory for me. I've been doing comedy for six years and I was just surprised at the level to which I can still fail at it. And I think it's important to tell stories like this because you usually hear about people's triumphs and successes. And I'm going to tell you about a huge failure because I told you about the Austin shows last episode and how fun and good they are and how well I was received. I go up in front of six people four of which were comics, two of which were audience members. I have a three-minute spot at this mic. After one minute of trying to do material, two women in the audience who were just audience members, not comedians, get up, say goodbye to their friends who were comedians, and leave. And as they're leaving, I can't help but comment on the fact that they had to only sit through two more minutes of my act and avoid deeply hurting my feelings and maybe they weren't thinking about that I was I was trying to be empathetic in this situation and my first thought was maybe in their minds they thought my set was going so embarrassingly bad that they thought well if we leave it will spare him the eyes of two more people which will alleviate the embarrassment but at any rate I comment on them leaving just like, hey, guys, have a nice night. And one of them turns around and goes sarcastically, obviously, uh, good night, nice jokes. Nice jokes. In the way I feel like uh, women will hear men on the street say, like, nice tits, it was just so cutting and disrespectful. And what was even more disrespectful is... It was the only time during my entire set that every single person in the room laughed. And that happens sometimes. But I had this moment in the middle of this deep, deep embarrassment where I was like, this is good for me. This is good because I've been having good shows and I've been getting booked more on shows. And you can really trick yourself when you're on an upswing into thinking like your shit doesn't stink. And you're actually and it's like, no, 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 no. This is the trickiest thing in the world. Anything can still go wrong. You can still feel like you don't know what you're doing. And that's okay. And anyone who's like, no, oh, well, uh, you, should, uh, th- you should never fail. And this is... Blah, blah, blah. I don't care about you. And I don't mean that harshly. I just mean if that's the way you see the world and your experience, I don't care to hear from you. I feel like... Falling on your face is very funny, even if you don't realize it in the moment. Looking back on it, I'm like, that's hilarious. That woman owned me. She completely dunked on me. If if I if I had if I was like uh if I was living that experience like it happened, I was like a little kid and I got pushed in the dirt and everybody laughed. It's like that's how it felt. And that's fine. You have to get owned sometimes. It's It should be considered not only a part of life, a necessary experience. Just getting the shit kicked out of you is so important. And I feel like people have this natural defensive trauma response around it. But no, 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 no. She slapped my little face. She took my little face and she went, and that's fine. That just happens sometimes. But anyway, that's that was my experience last night. I hope you enjoyed me sharing that uh, if you're a sick, sick person with a sadistic mindset. Uh, there's two news stories I want to cover before getting into the interview. The first news story I want to cover is actually local uh, for me. And here is the title of the article. 
Native Americans Urge Boycott of Tone Deaf uh, Pilgrim Museum. Now, this is a Pilgrim Museum I went to when I was there. It was called Plymouth Plantation, which should raise red flags right away. It was a field trip like any other field trip. It was a place where they brought school children in buses and other people talked to them and taught them things while our actual teachers uh, drank from flasks. And I'm sure you had that experience as a kid. Maybe you didn't see the teachers drink. Maybe you did, like me. Like, but And that's fine. Teachers need a break. They're underpaid, okay? They should be able allowed to drink on the job, at least during their lunch break, away from the kids. But if we do nothing for teachers, which we're not, we're not doing anything for them, we're not raising their, give them a little bit, a little bit of whiskey to get through the day, right? But this was something that I saw as a kid. People were offended by it and wanted to change. And when I was a kid looking around, I didn't have a sense that it was offensive because I didn't know anything. But it did teach me something that was very wrong, which is, oh, pilgrims and Native Americans were fucking best friends. Their story is like white men can't jump. Like a white guy came over, you know, they didn't really know a lot and they got taught. How to, they, they should have called that Plymouth Plantation. They should have called it white men can't grow corn. That's the level, and we all learn that. We all learn like, oh, the pilgrims came over and we're just absolute boys with Native Americans. And then you look, and it's like, oh no, that was like bad for every single second of the relationship except maybe the first Thanksgiving. And even then, let's look back on that story too because I'm not so sure that was all, you know, camaraderie and high fives and stuff. Yeah, they definitely should not, bring kids they should just bring them to sky zone it's like let's be honest here when you bring a kid on a field trip do you want them to learn and if the answer is yes i want you to ask every single person who has ever been on a field trip tell me something you learned on a field trip and not just something like um <laughs> not not just something like uh i learned that when you meet kids from other schools they will try to fight you OK, I'm not saying learn stuff like that. I'm not saying what did you learn on a field trip? Uh, sometimes if you ask your crush out, the entire school will make fun of you. OK, that's something I learned on a field trip. But I'm saying something you learned that was intended to be taught on the field trip. And the answer is nothing. And if you did learn something, you you should have misbehaved more as a child. OK, if you if you should have learned what happens when you pull a fire alarm at a whaling museum. That's what you should have learned on a field trip. But anyway, it's good that this museum is being uh, held accountable. I'm sure they underpay their staff. Great. Let's get rid of it. Let's just bring kids to laser tag and be honest with ourselves when we're doing a field trip, okay? You, any museum in the world is not going to have teach a kid because you coop them up in a cage for eight hours a day. And when you let them out of that cage, they're not in the learning mood. OK, they're going to run free. They're going to steal stuff from gift shops like a child should. OK, the second story is interesting. It's about a world I don't really know, which is acting. Uh, the article title says Sean Bean criticizes intimacy coordinators and intimacy coordinator is someone on set during a sex scene who tries to make sure everybody's cool with what's happening during the sex scene. Sean Bean, who is an actor in Game of Thrones, says that intimacy coordinators ruin spontaneity in sex scenes. Now, intimacy coordinator is one of these fancy pants names that we give a job to kind of skirt what they actually do. Intimacy coordinators are basically just people on set being like, get your fingers out of there. That's what an intimacy coordinator is. Intimacy coordinators are there to make sure men don't James Franco a scene up. They should be called the anti-Franco response team, okay? Because intimacy coordinators came about recently, and a lot of people really like them because they mitigate exploitation on film. Now, Sean Bean, may, I have nothing against him. I don't know what his like vibe is. I have no idea. He could be a completely awesome cool actor to work with i have no idea what his thing is if you're railing against intimacy coordinators in the entertainment industry i just hope that you're also taking steps to critique other parts of the entertainment industry because like the level of 
child exploitation in the entertainment industry, the level of young adult exploitation in the entertainment industry is so crazy that I just hope that you're also going for them before you get to, well, this one lady says I'm not allowed to uh, put this woman's tits in my mouth on set. And maybe that actress is cool with that and you're cool with that and it's totally copacetic and that's fine and if that's how you are as an actor hey good for you buddy but let's let's go after the fact that like nickelodeon has been harboring like people who worked for them who were just known sex offenders for a really long time the entire industry protected harvey weinstein there's probably 28 harvey weinsteins out there right now that we're just not addressing and maybe this is just something that you've said that's made it in like the viral media sphere and you do care about those other things but if you're a person not just sean bean but if you're a person who is like we need to get rid of intimacy or intimacy coordinators ruin spontaneity and scenes i just hope you have other issues i hope you have other irons in the fire right um that's enough news I feel like that was fun and good, but let's get to the interview with Laura Peak Again, please subscribe to the podcast. We're going to be on audio on the podcast app on Spotify very soon. So please enjoy. Have a good one. You know, it's it's minimalist. That's what I like. It's minimalist. I want to. That? Which is a really great way to excuse being incredibly lazy. Sure. With yeah. The no, that's what I want. I want something to be pretty fucking lazy. That, what was the, you had a clip about TJ Maxx. Was that TJ Maxx or Marshall? A very controversial clip. What? It, it... People are staunch defenders of TJ Maxx. Well, sure, They're, everyone's a Maxinista. Everyone's it's a, a great place to go, but that doesn't that doesn't refute that it's like the shittiest store you've ever been in. I think it's a. It's so funny because let me tell you this. This is about elitism. This okay. statement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People in the comments of that video. Uh, were saying, well, Ross Dress for Less is so much worse. And it's like, if you don't think it's the same store... Oh, my God. If you don't know it's the same store... Oh, my God, yeah. You're, you're insane, and you deserve... Like, you should be put... You should be put in, like, classes to teach you that there's more important things to focus and on. And they really think they're saying something. But if you're telling me that you're not going into a Ross Dress for Less, a Marshalls, and a TJ Maxx... And having complete deja vu, unsure right. which place you're in, you get a cute top out of it, but you have to pick it up off the floor. You'll find you'll find things with Nike symbols <laughs> on it, and I and I'm not saying you'll you'll see Nike products. I'm saying you'll you're, you'll see things with Nike symbols. You'll see on Nike it. symbols crudely drawn on, let's say, a hand towel. Or right. <laughs> I didn't know Nike made soap to spend. Yeah, I love that. This I love is that crazy. Video. I like how you can see his soft soap clearly X'd out of this with champion written over it. Champion. <laughs> An inferior brand. Uh-huh. An inferior. Champion. Champion is cool. Champion is great if you want a t-shirt that weighs five pounds. Oh, okay. If you want a t-shirt that's like a medium-sized t-shirt. It's not that it's a lot of fabric, but for some reason the fabric is made out of lead. It's septuple woven <laughs> it's not the thickness of it I'm as you said it's not thread count it's not quality so heavy yeah, i really hate those shirts wasn't champion like didn't champion get cool like a year ago yeah champion or, and like fila yeah and those, those sorts of brands uh that my armenian side of the family yeah. wore forever yeah, became yeah, yeah really popular and now they're the hottest guys on the block oh yeah now or are you kidding me yeah yeah champion. 17 year olds are looking at uh you know our Ar- armin davidian going oh my god that guy's so hot there's something about there's him there's something about armin davidian <laughs> i really like armin so davidian hot. that is kind of a very hot name though armin davidian <laughs> um so we've we've already started the cast. This is Laura. Uh, Laura is a very good friend of mine. Laura is 
a very good comedian. I think people who follow me know who you are because of the incessant posting of your clips you, that I did. Well, there was a big... Um, one-man campaign. Yeah, one-man campaign, yeah. Get Laura to 10K. Get Laura to 10K. And, and we did it. And we did it. We did, we did it. it. I'm did sitting it, at a cool 10.4. you kidding me? And 10. I mean, 4? we're going... I look at it sometimes, we're at, we're at four... Four, 10,497. Two days later, 10,422. I love it. Have I love you the realized game. at this point how meaningless it yeah. all is? Oh, yeah, yeah, Great. yeah. And I really do like when you're trying to get that little, that sweet little break off the 10K, right? Yeah. You notice when anyone unfollows you. The, oh, yeah. the, the wonderful feeling of just being like, I don't have to know the exact number of people right now. I mean, right. you're well beyond that, but it's like, it is pretty liberating. It's liberating. Well, I remember you were about to post that clip of the, uh, <laughs> abortion, joke. the abortion joke that yeah. you had. And you messaged me and you were like, will I lose followers? And I was like, is it the followers that you care you were, about? Yeah, that yeah, you would yeah, lose? yeah. But, my, but it is one of those things. Are my Republican family members going to unfollow me? Where I, I say that. But then it's like I'll put a video out and I'll, people won't follow me just because they don't think it's funny. Yeah, so well, it's that's like, what he did. oh, he didn't offend me at all. He's a hack. <laughs> which is so shit. much worse. It which is so is. much worse. Really I would is. so much rather. That's why, like, when you start bombing, you'll you'll sometimes dip into like being offensive, a little or bit edgy, because you'll be like, oh well, they didn't like me because it's like exactly. No, 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 no. I'd rather. Be, I mean, that's what comedy is now. I'd rather them be mad than not laughing at me. That's like half of stand up. <laughs> Did do you think that your Republican family members were upset at the clip? No, they they liked it, and I you know what I talk a lot of shit on them. Sure. My 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 immediate family. I mean. They're Republicans, but they're they're not sure. horrifying about it. I think the people, my Republican family members that would have seen it, probably have unfollowed me a long time ago. They're really the really far right ones, and they and still love you. They still love me, yeah, and I still love them. Just I mean, it's not the, the biggest. Do you have do you have family like this that you would disagree with politically a ton? <sighs> that I disagree with politically, um, no. Oh, what a blessing! Let me let me say this. You're uh, a Republican. <laughs> yeah, I. <laughs> I am just I'm a Trump like Republican. Them. Let me just say this. No. Um, <laughs> I will often say my biggest problem with my uh, family would be the fact that uh, my grandma supports abortion incredibly loudly in too public much. spaces. Too much. Late term. And late, literally, once it's born, Infanticide. she's like, "Get rid, get, it get, out of here. R- get these babies out of here." <laughs> no, she's. I I have one of the most like progressive. That's family. amazing. Pretty I mean, that's amazing. much, pretty much across the board. I have. They're insane people. Oh yeah. It's the it's the perfect kind of person where they'll be like screaming in the middle of the street about how someone in the neighborhood owes them money and they're gonna hit them in the head with a baseball bat and then turning around and going like protect trans. A kids. woman's rights to right. choose. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's yeah. that's a be- oh, that's a beautiful type of person because they're right. not bullshitting. Right. Well, yeah. that's what's tough. I mean, I talk to a lot of people. I guess I like even of the people I know from the south. Most of them have really liberal families too, because Nashville kind of became like a more liberal place recently. Yeah, but I, I struggle with this constantly because it's like, no, I'm not. I'm not going to stop talking to my dad. He's like, he's a, he's a he's a really nice guy. That was he, a big thing for a while, right? They were like, uh, make sure that you hold your family members accountable cut at out Thanksgiving. The cancer and right. well, okay, and that that is one thing. Right. I'm I'm so on board with that. I'll I'll, I'll yell at them until my face is right. It, right. It, we fight constantly. Right. But uh, my dad calls me and tells me he's proud of me like every day. I'm gonna mm. be like, fuck you, dad. Yeah. I, I, there's no universe where I just like totally cut out the cancer. Yeah, it's a <laughs> tough one. I've never had to really deal with it in terms of family members, so I don't really have a perspective on it. Which it's is, strange. It's very nice. It's very, very nice. Well, yeah, and I do come from a, you know, I'm a straight white lady. If I was like a gay woman and they hated that about me, that would be totally different. But I also right. think that they are good-hearted people and would understand regard. You know, they, 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 would, they would never choose their politics over their family at all. And there are a ton of people whose families 100% will do that, and I totally understand cutting those people out. I think it's too much time on Facebook. It, I oh, think that, like, oh, oh, people oh. are so spending too much time on, like... 
like me and like are so like no this is the way and i think when you bring that mentality into thanksgiving that's how a family no that's gets how it crumbles that's right how that's it how crumbles. it crumbles okay i have been, we've been talking about this a little bit i've been spending it may be boredom i'm about to quit my job shout out i shout uh out sh- shout out to not having a job i um but i've been spending more time on social media i'm trying i'm trying whatever i'm trying to since uh, you quit your job yes i'm trying right. to i'm trying to i'm trying to figure out what i'm dealing with and all of social media platforms, meta, all of this stuff has ch- have changed so much to where I'm seeing none of what I'm seeing is things that I want to see at any point ever. No. Right? It's all being voiced upon me. It's uh, people I've never met doing stand up. It's like political opinions from people I will never and have never cared about. Right. And now Facebook. This is the funniest thing because I laugh about what my Republican family members must be seeing because what I'm seeing, like my like targeted Facebook stuff, is like. <laughs> This year's about you. Like, don't let any... It's all the most insane, stupid, inspiring shit of just oh, being yeah. like, some people will never appreciate you for who you are. I'm like, do they... Do, do you think I'm 13 again? I'm amazed <laughs> at the algorithm of Facebook. It's all these, like, authors that are just like, sometimes you can give too much and yeah. nobody's going to respect your boundaries. Like, oh, stop yeah. talking to me like this. <laughs> no, it is It is funny because I, I went back on Facebook because I started posting stuff right, on yeah, Facebook. Yeah. And it is funny where it's like, oh, yeah, people do retweet just, like, a picture of a bunch of guys standing together in suits. And it says, like, pick, pick the ones who are going to be with you through the storm. Not just the ones who stand with you in the sunshine. Who's making this content? The fucking smartest people in the world. Right, right, right. right. Literally (laughs) geniuses. Because they know, oh, a million people are going to... Because they think they're a guy standing in the suit. Yeah, oh yeah. Every single person has at least the potential to become the guy in the suit who's driving the two-seater and has cut out all the toxic people in his life. And what's so funny is... Like, irony people online and people who are, like, super saturated with media will yeah. look at that and they'll go, oh, look at those, like, you know, losers Idiots, reposting. Right. There's stuff for you, too. Yeah. You're just not aware of it. But the stuff that you're reposting is the same. It's they the would same. have a look at that. It's and made would... for you. Yes, yes. Not in, like, a, you know, not in, like, a laboratory or whatever. But it's, like, there's Close stuff. Enough. There's stuff where, like, these social media platforms are, like, oh, this is what you, like, you're going to stay online if I keep showing you this, yes. keep showing this. It's, like, sure, it's, like, a Hassan Piker, you know, talking shit about somebody. Yes. But it's the same thing. But that's why, but that's, that, you're absolutely right. That's why I'm so concerned is that it's like, Meta, you have all of my information. Okay, I, yeah. I am on Instagram I'm 26 hours a day. You know who I want to compare myself to. Instagram, you show me exactly what I need to see to stay hooked on it. People that get hundreds of thousands of likes, people whose stand-up is taking off, whatever. You, you've got me in the pocket of just like total shame and embarrassment where I will come right. back every second of every day. Right. That's why it's so surprising to me to go on Facebook and just be like, do they know something I don't know about myself? Like, do yeah. they think that I'm like, that, I, that all the toxic people in my life are really about to get to me. I think it's more simple than we think it is. Like, I think that we put all this uh, all this importance and credence on, like, oh, they know all, the, like, the intricate details. But there's really simple principles that they follow. Like, the, the first one, obviously, is angry people click more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you get yeah. someone angry, whether it's angry because a guy who they agree with is talking mm-hmm. or angry because a guy they disagree with is talking. Mm-hmm. Angry people click more. Yeah. And the, the just just like really basic th- there was this thing where the BBC used to have this this big thing where they would have kind of like saccharine programming like you know whatever of have a beauty pageant. But they would show that to try to lead people into the next program Segment, which would which be is... which would be like a, a, a like educational piece, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And then that completely disintegrated when they had to start competing with like independent media sources where they were like, oh, we're go- it's going to be all beauty pageant. Yeah. Like, we're going to oh. have it all. Oh, and we're party. experiencing that on social media now where it's like, it's all, it's all dog and pony show now. Yeah. There's no, there's no lead in. There's no like, oh, here's some like nutrition for I, your brain. I got to get you right off the bat with feeling some sort of intense emotion. And it's like that, it sounds like elitism when you say that, but you go, oh no, when you're just driven by just completely your unconscious desires, <laughs> it's not going to benefit you I in know, any way. I know, Well, I find myself trying to like, and I know, you're right, I, I, I think I do think of it as being a little bit more complex than it actually is. They're looking at how long you're looking at something, they're looking at what you engage in. Have right. you found yourself being like, 
I, sometimes I'm like, I can outsmart it. I'm like, don't even look at that ad. I'm like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Which makes me insane. Right. <laughs> it's just like actually being interested in something, but like scrolling past it really fast so they don't know my metadata. <laughs> no, it's turn. good. You know, I, I do think that's actually a, a good mentality. <laughs> not that it helps at all. Of course not. But I do think it's a good mentality because at least you're being like somewhat of a conscious consumer yeah. of this. And you're somewhat being like, no, that I, I see that. Like, I'm for, too smart yeah, for that. Yeah, I see your bait. But they just keep getting smarter. They do, and it'll—I mean—it'll be the death of all of us. I have been talking to so many people who are taking like actual healthy breaks from it, and I'm like, bro, I'm too far gone. Like, I, mm. I, I, I don't know. No, I, you're not. I no, mean, you can take a break. I, I, after a really bad breakup, I was helping a friend move to Arizona, and I shut my phone off for three days because I just wouldn't need it. Some, like, some totally king off. shit. That's yeah. some. That's some. That's some really. That's a very good policy. And doing it, the the first thing I realized within the first like four or five hours is like, oh, this is easy. Yeah. It's actually not hard. Yeah. You just once you do it and you commit to it, it's actually not that difficult. The difficult thing is making the decision to, to do, do it, it. Yeah. and then pulling the plug. Right. You're I mean, you no, know, you're so right. On days that I will decide not to do anything if I go, I'm like, "Oh, I'm just outside like having a good time." But then I but then I, oh, I have taken some breaks and the fear creeps in. Or something where you're just like, I'm just going to check for one. I, right. As though something will have shit. Like if you picked up your phone when you were taking that break and your girlfriend just had like 600,000 followers all of a sudden. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like, my anxiety didn't work. That would be fine. <laughs> no, that would be good for her. I, I mean, hope, we love your ex-girlfriend. Yeah, I would hope <laughs> fake name Julia would, you know. I would hope Julia would have a good it's life. It's Julia Roberts. It's Julia. I was dating Julia Roberts. The prettiest woman. But, um, I was always jealous. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I guess it's just one of those things where when you're in it, like you said, when you're in it, it's scary because it does feel almost like you're living in the world oh, of it. Oh, yeah, You know yeah, what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Especially now when, when you put out like a comedy clip, do you ever feel like if you don't separate yourself from it, it makes you not funny anymore because you're constantly considering like the input and the data and the comments and the data that you're not thinking oh, about like... Is this fucking funny? Do no. I like this? And I and well and I don't. The I think the thing we everybody talks about this, but it is very true. The thing that it is doing to comedy is like I used to sit down. The greatest joy of my life was sitting down and writing a bit that was like eight pages long. Yeah. Like oh, oh that's so new to com- uh, sitting in a car outside of an open mic. Just so indulgent. I'm so jo- over- I'm Carlin, baby. Just absolutely oh, yeah. the longest stories, right. and you think you're gonna have a million pops in it, and then you go. And you do a mic and it falls completely flat and oh, you yeah. spent like an hour and a half writing it. And then you have the process of over the course of several months, you whittle it down. You maybe get 30 seconds of 30 good stand seconds. up from it. Right. But now, and that's, I, that's the way it should be. Now I'm starting where I'm going to sit down and write. And I'm like, I got to write something that's 15 seconds long. Uh-huh. Where it's like, that's not the way I've ever wanted to do stand up. It's not the way any of us have ever thought about comedy unless we're one liners and, and hardly anyone is. But it's just changed the, it's changed my process so much for writing things. And then you post the clip and then you watch your own goddamn clip 87 yeah. times in death. a row. It's it's like really the death of creativity in a way. <laughs> I, I think of this, I'll, I'll go live all the time. Like I'm so much deeper into social media than you are. <laughs> and it's like, you feel like you're deep into it. Yeah, and I, and I, you I are. I can't imagine. I, but I I'm, 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 and the thing is, Though I do feel like I've kind of struck this healthy balance by this is a really stupid way probably of getting out of it. But I'm just on multiple platforms. So I'm like, oh, none of these individually matter that much anymore. See, So I don't give a shit. Like if so-and-so isn't going well, whatever, I'm doing this other thing. But it's like when I when I go like live and I talk to people, which I truly enjoy. The thing is. I enjoy in my soul doing all of this oh, stuff, yeah, totally. which is which is I mean, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tell that. But a lot of comics don't, and I feel bad for them because it's like you're fucking funny, but you just haven't figured out this little formula yeah, thing. I know. You haven't figured out this little like niche thing, which is being good online. Yeah, I totally. I mean, I totally. And it's it is it is now the opposite of niche. It is like so. Uh, it's probably everyone's number one priority at this point, for the most part. Yeah. Uh, but I like I. I'm remind. I'm lucky that I'm reminded every single night how much I love to do stand up, because if I wasn't, I 
and I was only trying to subsist with like with really pushing hard online, I think I would have like quit because I, I, I don't find the joy. I, I, it's it's like I find the joy in very different areas. When live stand up went away, it was like I'm going to kill myself. So right. I feel I, I, I need that to balance my like healthy addiction to stand up to just con- or to social media to just constantly be. What, what were you doing when stand up shut down? Because because oh. you when you moved to L.A., you mm-hmm. were getting like a decent amount of work. Right? It was going OK. Yeah, yeah, it was really going OK. And it was like three months before the pandemic hit. Right. And then I mean, we had moved into like a 400 square foot studio in Koreatown and then just the fucking world ended. And I <laughs> here's what I did. I drank a lot of White Claw. I started sure. running. Started sure. running constantly. Got in better shape than I've ever been in. Cool. And that, that's that been the blessing is like I've learned that I have to do that to keep myself healthy. Uh, and then I would just write. And I would do like Zoom shows and lose faith in everything that I had ever done. I know so many. Did you do those? I was, I'm so blessed in that, <laughs> it's uh, in that yeah. no one wanted me to do stand up <laughs> during the pandemic or before the pandemic. <laughs> So I was never put on a Zoom show, really. So it was just the most perfect storm of of just sad. I loved it. Yeah, I, I absolutely loved it because it was yeah. the only thing that kept me like writing at all was just like I got to do a hot fifteen for this corporation in Phoenix, Arizona, oh, so and funny. their kids are in the fucking screens with them. What do you think about the people who hired you for that? Do you think the people? enjoyed it or do you think they were just like well here's an experiment let's see how i think they very much like i I would always watch the people who had clearly coordinated it like on the on the on the like the businesses side like when you do those corporate zooms there was all everybody everybody would have fun except for the comics and the people who organized it like you would see all of their employees being like this is pretty good it's fun and then them just absolutely terrified in the top left hand corner just being like are we about to are we crossing a line they were like so nervous about hr Interesting. Yeah. Oh, so they were worried about things that you were saying crossing the line. Mm-hmm. That's so sad. Imagine. It's like, don't, comedy is not a thing, it, it's, it's like one of those things where comedy is not a thing for every situation, no. every comedian is not for every situation. No, of course not, and I cannot imagine having... Like, the resources to be like, we're doing, like, a retreat. Like, a corporate retreat. Right. The things that you could do online to satisfy that itch. Have everybody do yoga. Uh, have oh, like yeah. a Have, like, a mindfulness thing. Do some fun, like, icebreaker shit. Hire a cam girl. Literally. Literally. And a cam guy. <laughs> and maybe... And a cam... Uh, Child. Non-binary. <laughs> no. No, that is not... No, no, no. <laughs> So, when we're talking about <laughs> sexualizing people, your mind goes from hierarchy, you know... It's wh- definitely woman first. Woman first. Sure. And then... I'm very woman first. And then man. Man. And then... And then the third... Way underage. The race child. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> you know, the thing is, the only corporations where you would see that is in LA. <laughs> that is certain production companies... Certainly, that is their hierarchy. We got the cam kids for right, you. Right. But just imagine having the resources to do something like that for your company and choosing stand-up comedy. I'm it's always I'm always amazed by that. It's decision. always, almost always, someone who is a fan of stand-up comedy. Right. Or, or, right. They, did a, they did a few mics in like 2013. Did a few mics. Were part of an improv troupe. That's exactly right. Something along those lines. And they're like, oh, stand-up would be fun. And they're like, these guys are wild. Yeah. They're like, you guys are just going to have your brains melted. And it's just us doing a clean 15 minutes. For anything, it's, it's like one of the, I, I think I told you that, or I, I mentioned this on the podcast, but I did a, I did a private, the only private event I've ever done, the only corporate event is that private stripper's birthday party. Yes. Wait, where was it? It was in like New a, Orleans. New Orleans. Okay. New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so fun. Everyone there was so nice. It was like a roast. I felt like my perform. it's a difficult situation. I, I grade myself on a curve because it's sure. like. Sure. Uh, unusual circumstances. You were brought in to roast someone that you've never met? I, several people, and my biggest mistake was I was like, okay, well, the, I should have taken more assertiveness in like, this is how the this show will be, but instead they were like, we want 30 minutes of roast material. That is insane. And I was like, if you want me to cover 30 minutes, I'm going to have to do stand-up and then some roasts, and I'm going to have to roast multiple people. Now, the mul- roast multiple people thing that went well, and like the general, like that went okay. I should have just not done the stand up. Did they hate it? 
this yeah it, well, there, it wasn't, wasn't about them it was it yeah. wasn't about that it was like not for the moment yeah like, that's that's kind of what i'm getting at is like stand-up is for certain moments in certain times and that's not to say that you can't do well in like weird situations like that oh yeah but it was just these people did not want to see me do stand-up comedy. Everybody was, like, a little bit tense. New Orleans is a place where everybody really loves each other, and there's this feeling of love. Yeah. So doing roast jokes in that situation. Well, that's not, I mean, I feel like that the most indicative part about that is that they were, like, roast one woman for 30 minutes. And right. It's like, this, is, this isn't uh, Donald Trump. But I should have <laughs> been... Yeah, he's the only person who could have done that. <laughs> Make no, fun not, of a woman for thirty minutes. No, I meant you're not making fun of Donald right, Trump. Right, 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 right. No, it was like the nicest lady. Oh, of I'm all sure. The, I'm the, sure she the was a dream. woman I the woman I roasted was the ni- everybody there was the nicest person I'd ever met. <laughs> That's such a which nice made it way worse because when I started like the jokes, there were people in the audience that were kind of looking at me like why are you being so mean to that? Oh, what are you doing? This is our friend. I this is our beautiful that. friend. I Why are you that. making fun you of that? You hired me to do exactly this. And so, like, I the show ends and I go up to my room to, like, you know, kind of decompress and take a deep breath. Because it didn't, it, I didn't bomb. It wasn't, like, a bad experience. I think that the people who hired me got their money's worth. Yeah. As a performer, they might not even, they might have been like, oh, it was, like, fine. It was Perfectly great, whatever. Good, yeah. As a performer, I felt like it was touch and go. As a comedian, it was one of those sets where it's like, there were laughs, but oh, I'm always right. thinking about the lulls and the oh. things that were supposed to be laugh lines that they don't... It's like when you're playing guitar, people are like, people don't notice when you miss a note, but you do. Yes, of course. And I feel like that was very true during all the Zoom shit, too, was that it's like, if you're in a club, you can feel the momentum go out of the room. If you're performing live stand-up in like a place that's for stand-up, right. you can feel it. And even people that aren't like very attuned to comedy can feel it. It's like, oh, he seems a little bit uncomfortable. But people who like could not give less of a shit about comedy as an art form are like, as, they're, right. they're like, they're doing, they're doing their monologue. Like right. it's, it, it, the laugh lines they and punch lines make, time. Yeah, make no difference to them. The, but so I go to my room afterwards and, uh, this woman comes because she's giving this other guy like a tour of the Airbnb that we're in and mm-hmm. she opens the door and she sees me lying on the bed. Literally full clothes, full suit on, lying in bed. Not a dominant posture. And she goes, uh, she goes, oh, like, sorry. And I'm like, no problem. She was like, oh, by the way, I have some advice for you. And I was like, uh, I was like, okay, sure. I was like, shoot. And she was like, I, I didn't think it was funny when you made fun of strippers. Uh, I think that, like, a lot of us are strippers, and that's not really what we want. Like, we like Dan. to make fun of customers. It's funny when you make fun of customers. How do I but know? But it's not funny when you make fun of strippers. And I was like, great. I, I was literally like, No, okay. there's nothing you can say to that. Yeah, there, yeah, there's yeah. no reason I to I was like, like, okay. And the, here's the thing. This is how I am with criticism, <laughs> and this is probably completely unhealthy. I'm like... I'm going to absorb that. Like, that's not a bad... Maybe she was right, and I think she kind of was right, where I was trying to be, be go up there and be like, Mr. Rose. But yeah. Like, that's not who I am. Yeah, yeah. And I was saying things that I disagree with, which that's part of comedy. That's not... I'm not sure. saying that that's not part of comedy. You're doing but that, I, yeah. I was like, maybe I was getting a little bit too far away from myself, because I didn't think those things about strippers... Yeah, you were like, was, these aren't true to my feelings, and right. also not the funniest thing I've ever said. Right. But <laughs> to be like... <laughs> To be like, hey, come roast our friend. She's a stripper. It's her birthday party. And then be like, you really went out on strippers. I'll say this. She wasn't one of the people who hired me. The okay, two, the okay, The two okay. people who hired me were very nice. Okay, okay, and, fair enough. And fair like enough. very complimentary. She was just there. But that's why I was saying it was It was like a weird, it was like a touch and go situation. <laughs> well, I think it's very, I think it's a, if, if I think about it more, the insight into making fun of people who are, who are constantly in strip clubs is, is much easier than making fun of strippers. But I wouldn't have come at it from oh, that yeah. angle where I you it would either. Be, it's a hard one. Yeah. Have you ever done a weird gig like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've done, I think, I think probably the weirdest where it was like, who, who am I talking to right now? Was the, uh, was like a book fair at the Nashville Public Library. Oh. Center of downtown Nashville, two o'clock in the afternoon. Tell cool. me, tell me when you got, the, how did you get the message for that gig? Uh, how did you like hear about it? Somebody reached out to me. They were like, uh, they had seen a show somewhere else and they were like, you seem bookish or whatever. And I was like, love, I was like, I- <laughs> <laughs> love books. Yeah, I saw your comedy. You seem like a fucking nerd. You seem nerd. like a fucking nerd. Not funny at all. Love the glasses. <laughs> Doink. Yeah. <laughs> so. 
So she hits me up and she's like, we have the book fair. Big fan of the book fair. Love scholastic fairs. Spent a lot of time at them. Love the library. Right. But get to the thing. And it was really funny because it was me and I would say probably like the most, um, he's not like edgy. I would never describe him like that. But just kind of like an outlandish dude named Josh Wagner. Funniest guy who ever lived. Shout out right. Josh Wagner. We, they booked both of us. And like probably more so than most people they could have booked in Nashville. Like, pretty dark material for 2 p.m. at a book fair and then you and, sit down and, and it, let me ask before you keep going how how many years have you been doing comedy how many years have, has josh been doing comedy at this point josh probably he was a few years before me so he had probably been doing comedy about five years i've been doing okay. comedy maybe two okay 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 yeah so you, both fairly new especially for a tricky situation oh, you especially and, and let's say this bad i mean you're you're bad you're bad like too. you're bad yeah, you yeah. have some good bits that work in the right rooms at the right, right time at a club at a show that it's meant for you can trick people at every five shows you do that you're a comp that i that, yeah that i'm like a good writer right. i think that's what i was, yeah, yeah, I was yeah. really that's banking fair. on that's that fair. at the time uh which does not apply to this situation at all so it's uh eight thousand degrees outside we're in a tent there is someone playing like like gregorian shit <laughs> Like a real like like some dirges going on behind us. Are you talking like oh? oh. You know they uh, in the seventies they became popular to play those uh, while you fucked. I like see, play Gregorian chant that, while you had sex. I I, I gotta say Go I don't know if like eyes wide shut put that into me or something. Right. But I've always I, I could I've always been able to see myself doing that. But let me tell you something. I tried doing that with uh, an ex girlfriend. And, uh, and and okay, obviously your idea where you like let's yeah let's see how this and it, we couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> we it was so not and I was just like, how did people do this? It was so because you have to like the thing about that is if you're pl- you have to be a guy with like a fuck dungeon. Yeah, a total fuck dungeon. You have to be a guy who like. Takes himself very serious. Well, that's, just like, <laughs> that's not that's not sex anymore. Right, you have to that's look not like that. Sex anymore. Yeah. That's not sex anymore. That's a ceremony. It's a ceremony. That's like that's a right. Exactly. All right, <laughs> right. You are obviously trying to impregnate her. I feel like <laughs> <laughs> with with a spawn that will go on to do evil acts. Rosemary's baby. Yeah. One hundred and ten percent. But, but so okay, playing. wait, wait, wait. I have always thought about that, and Go I'm on. happy to know that I would never be able to take myself it's seriously doing so it. It's so funny. I, I, I think I found it, but was was maybe that baked into our minds because of movies like that? It could Where it was been. like big sex party It's situation. very possible that you're just really fucked up, <laughs> and that you've always just connected those two things. It's very possible. I was raised Catholic, and I mean, right. if you have listened there to go. the music and got a hymn... I mean, we're coming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Every time. Every time. Um, okay, so we get... To, it's so funny. They were... The the funniest part about this is that that music was coming... Like, someone was, like, spinning. Right. <laughs> was, like, spinning this. There was, like, a... There was, there was 100%. Are you guys ready? <laughs> oh. There was Here's some chance you never even fucking heard, heard before. before. I've only heard, like, two. This one goes, oh, oh. <laughs> Y'all know this one is like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so he's playing, he's playing chance. Yeah. We assume it'll stop. It's one of those, I actually did a show like this recently. I, I gotta tell you this story because it was, it was the best thing that's ever happened to me. But like, where someone obviously no idea how to produce a comedy show. There's no, they're like, you guys ready 70% to of comedy go show. up on there, you know, just get yeah. up, get up on that little, that little stage. Just yeah. no introduction, no, right. nothing, uh, no light, no, yeah. you know, anything. Uh, but by the t- Josh went up, all adults in the audience. He went before me. It was like it was like like nerdy, like forty year old like comic book guys, and they were loving it. Great audience. Right. right. That's a it, 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 Josh is a very dark dude. He had a lot of dark stuff. He's a very funny guy, like really working class guy. Absolutely killed. The moment that he gets off, they leave. Just white, like thirty five year old, very rich white women with children. I would say. Six and below, yeah. just funnel it. So I, the entire front row. So the audience changes in between you. No, it just happened that way. Like they it were just, just like, oh, that was fun, but and then no, that's what I'm saying. But like naturally, you're performing in front of a different mm-hmm. kind of group of people. Completely, completely. Wow. And the entire front row was like dogs and babies. 
Right. And I, and it was one of those where it was like, you're doing so bad. My audience. That, I mean, that is your audience. Yeah. Hey, what's up to all, what's up yeah. to Dan's dogs and babies? Wait. Far, they don't know what you're saying, but just make big faces. Make big faces. <gasps> Go on. That works for both. It's nice. <gasps> um, just, it was one of those bombs where you, like, I, it was just an out-of-body experience. Yeah, and afterwards, was... they were like, I don't know, you know, if we'll do, I think they, like, barely paid us. I think it was, yeah. it was one of those, like, I know you don't even, I know you know you don't even deserve money for this. Right. Well, you deserve, that's the thing. Is I deserve more we, money we for it. We have this anyway. bad, we have this bad mentality as comedians where it's like, uh we're so judgmental of ourselves that we're like, oh, well, I didn't even deserve my... It's like, no, you showed up and you did you did a bad job. Did a very bad job. Yeah, I've well, done and, that before too. And the whole thing, same same thing, where it's like, if someone is completely unused to watching comedy, they think you're... They're like, oh, she they, she did her monologue. Like, she right. did her she did her one-woman show for us. And sure, I wasn't laughing, but is that what comedy really is? You know, yeah. like, I feel like they don't really have a concept of the fact that you're supposed to consistently make people laugh. Did any of the dogs or babies seem like they liked it? One baby was really into me. Oh. One baby was really into me, and we kind of hung out afterwards. She made me feel a lot better afterwards. That she was kind of hanging everything. around my little feet, and she was really precious. And her mom didn't seem too mad either, but they were the only two people in the audience that liked they, it. That's, yeah. Yeah, those those horror bombs. Those, those horror those bombs. Real horror bombs. But then you survive that. Oh yeah, I and survived like, every single one. And you're like, oh fuck, I could, I'm alive still. That's and so I, crazy, I could feel this uh, bad and still be alive. I think that is half of the reason I do not do comedy because I hope that I do consistently good. I I do comedy because I know that one, and I don't know which one it is little Easter egg every now and then. I'm going to eat my fucking dick for fifteen plus right. minutes. And then you're completely rejuvenated. You think about it for two days, and then you're like, I guess I'm going to go kill in a row. It's, it's so thrilling in that way. Do you feel like it sneaks up on you yes. when you do poorly? Yes. Like, you can you you sometimes can tell beforehand, but then sometimes... Sometimes I'm like, I'm going to... You look at the crowd, you feel the audience out, you're like, I'm going to absolutely destroy. I feel like that's, that is that is so many people that I respect, like, big bombing stories, is like, I, ha- I had it in the bag. It, it, it's not a bad room. Right. Everyone's crushing. Every comic before me, every type of comedian before me, men, women, everybody, are all killing. And babies then you're like, oh, babies, babies, yeah. babies, cam kids. And then you come in. No. I'm sorry, I'm going to stop talking. No, no. We don't talk about the cam. We're not bringing back up the cam kids. I'm sorry, kids. I can't stop. Okay, I'm the I'm a really good kids. person. I'm a really good person. The cam kids came up. They had their time. They had their time. But I feel like that's the best part about it is that everyone I know who I respect have no trouble saying like the room was electric yeah. and I I completely killed the energy. Oh yeah. And good comedians. I mean, it happens to good comedians all the time. Oh, I've been there. Oh yeah. So many, so many. Yeah. Times. Oh, it's unbelievable. Were you a like, I have this in the bag. Of time. <laughs> a time I've never done well at a show one time. Dan, I, he posts a lot of stuff online, but he. Um, He's actually not allowed to do comedy in L.A. I've been told I'm, I can't do comedy anymore because I bombed too many times. Which yeah. is so funny because there are people who uh, have committed, you know, serious crimes in L.A. Yes, who yes. Who <clears throat> are comedians who are still allowed to perform. But they're getting like a chuckle where they need to. Right, I to. guess they do. They get laughs later. Yeah, and good. like Dan, ni- you know, nice enough. Nice enough guy. Enough. No, yeah, definitely yeah. nice enough guy. Yeah. Uh, pretty personable but it's just like i you know he'll come to me with bits he'll be like is this something right and uh even when he's saying it to me maybe i'll be laughing but the moment he hits that stage right oh it's different animal. dead air yeah, different animal. i mean and I, I i friends of his, like really good friends are watching they've never heard the bit before it's not like they're tired of it no no one can even smile they can't even smile i've seen people relapse in the audience. I've seen people I've known that were like, I, I haven't drank in, in six years and I'm doing really well and it's two minutes into dance set and they've got a shot of vodka in their hand and yeah. it's sad. No, there was there was this experience where, uh, you know, in, in Tuscaloosa, I was doing stand-up there and there's nothing funny about Tuscaloosa, mm. by the way. Mm-hmm. No, it's a very serious place. <laughs> I was I was doing a new joke. I was really excited about it. Uh, I got the audience really, you know, I'm going by being like, how are you tonight? Like, mm. no, seriously, how are you? Which is my best bit. That's oh, you nail life. that. We can do better than that. Yeah, we can do better you should, than you that. You t-shirts that say we can do How better. many times could you add, 
derail for a second. How many times could you ask an audience, "Can we can do better than that until they give up? How many? Do you think that there's there must be a number on it? There's just people hanging from the rafters. I feel just... like three. Yeah, I feel like three. Oh, three is, three is generous. It should never be more than two. We could not do better. But if that. you continue, here's the, sorry to, sorry to name drop on the pod, okay. but I could see Simon Gibson doing that 27, 27 times, times yeah. and the the reaction increasing every single every time. time. I could, yeah, he could do that. He could but fill anyway, a 10 minute set. I'm in Tuscaloosa. <laughs> I'm going, we can do better than that. So I do my first joke. And in the middle of me telling, my, you know, getting to the first punchline, uh, in the dead silence, I hear a clink and I see a guy's taking out a hypodermic needle, right? Mm-hmm. Full of uh, fentanyl, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And he's there with his wife and he's there with his baby. And did it, did the, did the needle say like fentanyl on it? Or yeah, you, you it were said, just sure? It said, well, I was like, I was like, hey, what's that? Doing crowd work. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's like, Fent- it's fentanyl. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh no, don't relapse on my show. And he said, no, actually, this is my first time using. He's like, I've been sober my whole life, but during your set, during your set, I I went out back like during your first joke, he which is found... crazy because my first joke was only maybe like a minute long. But it but it it was Enough we could do time. better than that. It was yeah, it was during the week we could do better than that. He just had a feeling, so he went out back, got a syringe full of fentanyl, uh-huh, uh-huh. and then as I'm talking to him, and I thought. I thought, well, at least he didn't relapse. Yeah. Right? Well, that's yeah. not a relapse. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's not you. I, I mean, it's kind of better than what I've seen you do to other people. Right, right, which, right, right. Which, right, you know, right. they've had struggles with this before. It's like they're revisiting. This was like, um, I don't know, that's like a, it's it's almost as if he was in a cult, uh, the point of which was to always find humor in something. And the moment that he knew he could not he find humor he, in anything. There was no God. He has a capsule in his, in right. his molar. <laughs> I would love to put a capsule in my molar, not with anything dangerous in it, know, just I'm, to have a little, I like... I really want to know what that's like. It's just a gu- one gusher. It would be cool <laughs> if it was, like, or just, like, it's full of maybe, like, Benadryl. Like, get a little sleepy. <laughs> All right, we got questions, folks. Oh, we love questions. First uh, question. So, I reposted your joke. It's very funny about country music singers yes, in the National Airport. Gosh. This question is, uh, who is your favorite country music singer? I have many. I have many. And I know you're not a Southern man. So I like I hope... country, though. You like country? I like country, Okay, yeah. okay. Do you, do, you, do you have a specific era of country that you're into? I like, so with newer guys, it's like the, God, I hope I pronounced their names right, but it's like Sturgill Simpson yeah, and Sturgill Tyler, Tyler Childers. Yes. And, uh... Uh, like yeah, those those kind of like newer sort of they're badasses. Of, yeah. they're very cool. They they represent uh like a new a class of new country that I think is really good. And, and it's like if you count Angel Olsen. Yeah. Them, oh, totally. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah I like I, I like Angel Olsen. Um, I, in that camp for me, I'm gonna do it by era. Yeah. <laughs> in that camp for me right now, Margo Price. Margo Price is awesome. So freaking good, and so like taking country in such a cool direction. They're doing so much cool stuff, and right. the fact that they've like reach the stages in Nashville and like nationally that I feel like people like that were not reaching for years and years before right. is so sick. Um, favorite all time. I just pass out favorite of <laughs> favorite of all time. Unfortunately is Hank Williams, but that it's just, Hank it, Williams. it's the, it's the, it's my favorite sound in the world is to hear Hank Williams. Is Hank Williams. Why is that unfortunate? Well, because I want it to be something, I want it to be something woker than that. I think, but well, I, you didn't say Hank Williams Jr. No, I didn't. You know what, what what I mean? was like, oh, I'm sorry. Hank Williams Jr. <laughs> are you guys ready for some football? <laughs> all my rowdy friends are coming over. Tonight. <laughs> was that Hank Williams what? Jr.? I think so. That's so funny. One of my favorite country music singers. You know, being from Nashville, I gotta say Hank Williams Jr. No, I love Hank Williams so much. He's probably my favorite. And then we talked about this a little bit before the pod, but truly, uh, big fan of the Dixie Chicks. Now the Chicks. The Chicks. I don't know who I'm talking. Am I talking to your computer? Uh, the uh, the Chicks, and on the, on the opposite end of the spectrum, if I'm getting ready to go out and I'm hanging, especially in Nashville, we're going to a bar, we're going to a dive... I'm throwing on some Toby Keith and I'm throwing it on hard and every time. Now you, you were telling me before Toby Keith derisive figure in country if people people might not be aware. Yes. Okay, well it's funny that I like them both so equally because they had a very he and the chicks very, very public argument about the mm-hmm. war in Iraq and he's right. an idiot and a Republican and they're the coolest women who have ever lived and they very uh, loudly called him out for being uh, just this xenophobic idiot. And so much truth to it on their side. Love you, chicks. Hope to come see you someday. But if 
Should Have Been a Cowboy comes on. You familiar with Should Have Been a Cowboy? Right, yeah. Okay. I am going to take my shirt off and swing it over my head. Right. Uh, he makes music that really touches my soul. Yeah. And even like even the stuff that sucks, I'm just full throated. I'm it's in confusing, it. isn't it? it? Now, did you start listening to him at a young age? I started listening to him at a younger age than I would have the chicks, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, because that was what was like primarily on country radio at that time. And I will say, the absolute best era of country for me, which is t- Killian McCassie and I got in a, a little tip over this the other day. I really do think it's '90s country. I think '90s country is the. I think Shania Twain, the chicks. Uh, Toby Keith, Alan Jackson, I think is yeah, that is a derisive opinion. It is, it? it is, it is the I really it I, I want to be like '60s country roles, and it always will. I love all of those people, but I love '90s country just probably because I was great because when you grew up. Yeah, yeah. I remember and that like the when I have the joke about Jody Messina, Queen, absolutely underrated, has like the best twangy voice in the entire world, and they all put out like three albums that like like. Top to bottom, just absolutely ripped. Yeah, and that's what I go to now. Like if I if I really need to be in a good mood and not think about anything, it's '90s country all the way. You know, it's funny when it comes to opinions like that, which I don't think is very derisive. He was just a guy like many people of the time supported the Iraq War, which turned sure. Out like, Sorry, Toby Keith. You whatever. You're you're you're. He's like every person I've ever met. No, I life. mean no. He's I, listen. He's a piece of shit. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm not. No, I'm. I'm actually taking probably the least uh, equitable <laughs> opinion here, which is, uh, I. It's funny, with all this stuff where it's like separating the art from the artist and all that. I've never had a trouble with that, and I think it may come from my f- a fundamental inability to love. Oh, from me. but that's but let me. But let me explain. It's like I, when I consume media. I, I never consume media and I'm like, oh, I love the person who made of this. Of course, of I've course I've always not. been like, oh yeah, this is like a good song, yeah. but I'm not co-signing anything. Of course. X, Y, Z. is Like if it can't, like I love Sturgill Simpson uh, and, and like I've never heard anything nefarious no, of him. He seems like a boy. really cool, nice guy. But if it came out tomorrow that he was doing nefarious stuff, I would. It wouldn't feel like a friend of mine. Yeah, exactly. Like, it was not You know what I, I mean? Don't, I don't have that either. I don't yeah. have that either. But it does become a cultural thing to be like, or just like a social thing to be like, we're throwing on Toby Keith with no down. with no asterisks yeah. next to it because you just have to be like, That's we're so, so aware. But of course, I mean, I I think the fundamental thing of like art from the artist is like. How good is the art? Because I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I will, I will repeat, watch many, many things that I yeah. know I should now be uh, staunchly against. I was, uh, I was listening to Sunday Service Choir's album, which is just like uh, gospel music, I love and it. I was driving through West Hollywood, and it was Gay Pride Month, and I got enough like cross look, and I'm sure if I talked to those people, they would just be like, but. It just seems like a political action, yes. listening to gospel music in West Hollywood. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very true, and no matter like, how wonderful it is. Right. I wish I could just, like, write on the top of my car, like, hey, I'm all for, I just <laughs> I like, the sound is doing. cool, yeah. <laughs> Tell me you don't enjoy this. Tell me you don't enjoy <laughs> Okay, second question. Do you think about what you wear on stage, and uh, is that affected by how you might be seen as a woman in comedy. I think definitely. I think every every gal, every female comic deal female comic. Oh female. Every comedian. You said that. Oh my god. Uh I think everybody deals with that. But, but okay, everybody does. Everybody I, I would like someone to come up to me and say this is your uniform for the stage. And it's just like a pair of pants that look good on me. Everyone has to wear the same jumpsuit. Literally. I, yeah. I, I would love that type of equity in comedy. If we all had to put on... Ha- I would happily do that. I would. I don't want to think about it for a moment. I don't want yeah. to think about how what I have on changes the way that someone might perceive me. I do think that sometimes if I get up there and I'm wearing something like cuter or like form-fitting, I'm often like, I'm going to do some grosser jokes up top so that no one feels weird. Like so, Like so that... You disarm the might disarm the women in the audience and, that's and really disarm the men smart, at the same time. That's kind of sad. It's very it? sad. It's very sad. I should be yeah. doing whatever I want to do on stage, but you do have to kind of like you can you can feel the difference. Uh, 
I don't think about it as much anymore because I've just kind of been in this era of just like, let's throw on a t-shirt, let's throw on a pair of jeans we like, and then we're sticking to it. You go through different, on what you wear on stage, you go through different eras. Yes. Oh, oh, totally. Right? Yeah. Yes, totally. There are like, uh, and then I, I'm really bad about this because truly it's on my mind constantly that I just want someone to tell me what to put on. I, I am not a fashionable person. I have never been. I want like a, I want a stylist for two months to just be like, these are your stage outfits and you're going to wear them for the next five years. So you have like no, do you have a feeling at all of, well, this expresses me? No, 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 literally never, literally never. I no, I could not be dumber in the arena of clothing. It's not dumb. It's just a personal, it's just an interesting personal work. and, and, And I feel like some people might, um, like, uh, defend against that by being like, oh, I don't care about it. I care about it very much. I want very much for a little fairy to come over my ear and be like, You're, I'm going to develop your personal style. But it just has never been second nature to me. The act of buying clothes and making them look good on my body is not fun for me. It is not something I enjoy doing. So what you're saying <laughs> is that not only does wearing clothes bring no personal joy to you by being a form of self-expression, it is also sort of a prison in which you live where you only see the negative and not the positive. I would say it is primarily a prison in which I live. Where I, okay, all right. We all get a thing every now and then. Sure. Fun shirt. You're Fun like, shirt. I feel great in this shirt. Okay, yeah. we all have like items that we really love. But as it relates to stand-up, yeah. that's where it gets me because I don't, I don't want what I'm wearing on stage to be indicative of who I am at all. I just want my I want my words to work. This is kind of a big conversation in stand up, but like have you ever had someone try to correct you for what you were wearing or try to tell you what you're wearing is distracting or bad? Um I mean we all have the classic oh sorry. We know. all have the classic um we all, we all have the classic uh, don't wear shorts on stage, which is ridiculous, and the planet yep. is g- uh, about to burst into flames, and we literally will have to be wearing less clothing on stage. Right. And I'm very happy for the people who are championing, I'm wearing a dress every time I'm on stage, I'm yeah. wearing shorts, who gives a shit? That has been probably the only thing where like I'll end up in like a short dress, and you'll get like a comment or two from like a from like a booker or something that has happened to me that has happened but it, but it's like it, 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 distracting to who bro it's obviously you uh right. that has never really bothered me but then i mean the second you you've experienced this the second you get like a clip or something that like does okay online people are going to talk about your clothes i sure. had the funniest i don't think i told you this but i, had, I let me preface this by being like the degree to which i get it is right of course you can so have on. not even close I mean, the level of scrutiny that I'm under is so minimal compared to fucking any woman in comedy. It's not. And I'll say this: among guys in comedy, I have a pretty reasonably high level of scrutiny. Yeah. Because it's like, I mean, my looks are often being commented on on my videos. And totally. Stuff. And people have brought that up, and they're like, "Oh, does it make you feel?" And it's like, no, because a. There are none of them. They're all pretty innocuous. Yeah. Even like yeah. the kind of outlandish ones to me are pretty innocuous. Yeah. And the second thing is like, it's not even close to level of scrutiny that like a woman with a low level of scrutiny. Right. Has on their uh, uh, it's night and day. Oh uh, yeah. A woman with like, uh, the, like one eighth of your audience yeah. is probably getting uh, an insanely higher amount. And I'm not trying to be fucking Mr. White Knight of course, here, right, right, but right. it's like, I can't fucking complain about. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I mean, I do. A lot of women that I know are kind of operating under that principle where it's just like, I'm wearing something shapeless and I'm getting on stage and like loose jeans and it's like, fuck off. I'm not trying, you know, I want you to listen to what I have to say. But then it's also right. so cool to be like a really fashionable person who looks cute as shit and like hot on stage, but you're going to get, you. I mean, people roundly despise you for it for immediately. It's so upsetting. Yeah. I did have... A clip that I was like really proud of and it was on it was from that don't tell set and it got on YouTube and or they did it on like YouTube shorts and uh and I it was one of those where it was like it was the first like really 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 viral stand-up thing that I had Mm -hmm. and I was looking at the comments and I was like I really kind of like took a breath and I was like I was like I'm doing this like I'm going to look at these and I'll probably read every single one if I'm not going to do it right now I know I'm going to do it over the course of the next few days let's get this out of the way and I'm reading through all the comments it's like so incredible like nothing cruel at all so incredibly positive i was just like oh my god and then i came to one comment (laughs) it's the one out of like a thousand yes and it went but it wasn't even (laughs) i came upon this one comment and this dude just goes he just wrote the word heavies (laughs) and i was like 
Is that tits? I was like, guys, is yeah, that I, is that big honking mayonnaise? Yeah, 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 yeah. Is that big is. unwieldy mayonnaise? And then just having to look away from thousands and thousands of positive comments to Google is heavy. heavy's boobs, and, and then be like, yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's why it's funny because you know I think things are getting better. I think maybe there's more women in comedy now than yes, there were yes yes but it is like inherent an inherently political thing you're inherently politicized no matter what oh, i feel being a woman in comedy right because yeah, oh, is that how it feels because that's how it when i look at it i'm like no matter what even if it's like even if it's positive even if it's like you know you're a woman in stand up, it, so and you're doing great. Yeah, you're doing great, or you're getting like you know on a all woman comedy lineup or whatever, which like you know, the, great. But yeah. it's still a fucking politicized. Oh, totally. You're constantly reminded of it, even if it's positive. And and the the you will get there will always be things commenting on your looks, and everyone loves to do that. But I would say, I mean, what you're gonna get immediately directly out of the gate is uh, 80 comments that just say like women can never be funny and it, and it, uh, I mean, tell me yeah i'm interested in your experience with getting those because obviously i've but, i don't understand okay what it's like. so they r- immediately i mean there it's like there are people who just lie and wait to to say this but women only talk about sex women can't be funny women can't be funny uh there's no woman has ever made me laugh whatever it's just people with you know extremely deep-seated uh, issues that uh, i mean they're everywhere that is like half of our society is people i think who think that and it's not the male half, half, half of men. I think I really do think are just like there's no chance that comedy is ever going to be good from a woman, um, and believe that deep in their souls. And I mm-hmm. can never fix that. What I struggle with is sometimes you do a joke that is not particularly about being a woman, or it's you know the one you posted, like it's something about being from the south, or like something that you know, it's some observation or something. Bits like millions of women comedians have everybody has that material no one is doing comedy solely about being a woman at the same way that men are not doing comedy solely about being men i do though oh yeah you kind of you kind of a real like, guy's guy I'm really. like, fucking, my shoulders <laughs> my are so shoulders fucking broad. Broad. i hate how broad my <laughs> fucking show you ever walk we with can do better than that. and your fucking chest out you have to put your chest out and everybody's like <laughs> It's all people in construction. <laughs> They're wearing the fucking hard hat. <laughs> yes. But the, but you you do jokes about anything other than that and then you get unfortunately a fair amount of both women and men consumers of comedy saying like I love that she's not talking about being a woman. Oh my god, that and must then, be so funny. And then you're annoying. the fucking guys gal to these people that you never asked to be in good graces with and it's right. so offensive that that is the only thing that they like about you. It is that is more frustrating to me. I would rather have someone shit all over me for talking about my period than have someone be like, I like how she's like not even a girl. It's like, yeah, that is yeah, so yeah. fucking annoying. I, and that is kind of a lot of the time, the majority of what I get things that people think are complimentary that are actually just so horribly offensive to myself and to every other woman comedian. They think right. that you're, they're going to, you're going to like them for being like, I see you as different. I see you as like a different type of chick, like a real like down ass girl. I'm like, I hate, I would hate you in person. I, I would, would step you on your person. balls. I swear yeah. to God. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. Yeah. So d- does that strike you as being kind of a constant or is it sort of become white noise now? It is, uh, like to me personally or yeah, like in personally. comedy, um, uh, it is kind of white noise because I because I have such a chip on my shoulder about it. I can tell when yeah. someone's about to say that to me. And we all get that. All 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 women comedians get this after a show. But like, my girlfriend thought you were really funny, or like I don't normally like women stand ups, but you were really funny. It's like every single thing has this just like subtext that's just like, yeah almost all of you aren't good at this, but you kind of made me laugh. Like that's the right. highest compliment that we can ever receive. Right. And it is, uh, I've put it on the back burner now. Right. Cause when you get something like that, like the, Oh, you like pretty funny for a woman or whatever. It's like, that feels even worse because they're putting, they're immediately putting an asterisk near their, uh, compliment. Yep. But they're also separating you from this fucking group that you are a part of. That I'm very much proud, proudly yeah, a part of. Part, yes. Yeah. And are like set trying to 
set set themselves out as like an individual admirer of mine where right. I'm like a lot of people think I'm fine. Like it is not it is right. it is not like a huge you're compliment not, to you're me. You're not getting in on this at the ground. It, 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 it sounds so shitty, but it, it, it yeah. does feel that way. It makes me really, really mad. Yeah. Where it's just like I've got a kind of an eye for like chicks who aren't bitches. Yeah, <laughs> and, like yeah, that is yeah, the yeah, subtext. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> so funny <laughs> that was very annoying i she was different i gotta see was different like yeah. we could hang we should yeah you should listen to the <laughs> cool ass music i listen to do you want to be on my pod yeah i <laughs> know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before i ask somebody to be uh, a guest on the podcast i always try buttering them up by telling them they're pretty funny they're pretty yes and you yeah. did i mean he that's how he dm'd me we that's actually... why i dm'd will too which <laughs> it's confusing that he would be on the podcast though, but he really liked it uh what's your biggest hurdle in stand-up and i'll i'll take that outside of stand-up and i'll say what's your biggest hurdle in your career in career wise i i think um like we just talked about there are a lot of barriers i think and there are a lot of like um maybe things that we interpret with the things in the comedy world that we uh, uh, interact with differently or that affect us differently and I think all of those things matter everything we've talked about matters but ultimately uh, I think that I am the biggest hurdle in my career wow. I really I, I think that my um, insecurity or my belief that I don't have anything important to say or that I'm like not inherently interesting or funny or the shit I put myself through constantly of just being like you know, just really, really feeling bad about yourself, depression, whatever. But it's like it, right. it, it, it. I think I'm, I'm my biggest. I'm in, I'm in my own way. That's why it took me forever to, took me five years of like being fairly, you know, six. I mean, not absolutely just blowing up, but being fairly consistently su- successful at stand up. Five years of just working a nine to five and not trusting that I could ever make this work and like just hold, holding myself back, not like taking leaps that I knew I was ready for. Sorry for such a serious answer, but I don't. No, but no, I, this is good. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm, I'm always my own worst enemy. I'm always the one who's like, maybe you're not ready for this, or maybe no. you're not good at this. It's just funny because I, I see that question. And I go, my biggest hurdle is literally every other human being on the planet <laughs> who's not me. Ah! So that's really interesting that you would feel <laughs> that way about your. It's almost like it's the all in the end. because yeah. I feel like I'm. I'm kind of the greatest thing to ever happen. No, okay. No, it, it, it's, it's, it, I completely agree with you, obviously. <laughs> it, for all whatever barriers or shit that you have to, it's like, it's always going to be you at the end of the day who's like, yeah, I didn't have to take that nap. Dude. I could have written a joke. Oh, totally. I didn't have to fucking like, you know, whatever. It, it's always kind of coming down to you. Yeah. If you're auditing yourself. It's like, yeah, mostly me. Yeah, yeah, me. In any arena that I am allowed to, like... Because we do this on our own. For the for the first many years that you do comedy, like, you're booking yourself. You're, you oh, know, yeah. you're your manager. You're your t- talent. You're, like, you're, you're a marketing expert. You're everybody. And it's like, if you don't have, like, a really fundamental belief in being good at something it'll really sideswipe your ability to to promote yourself and stuff totally. and i feel like i talk to i think that is a bigger can be a much bigger concern for like women who are starting or like non binary people you know anybody else who is starting to realize that it's like i might have something to say and it's like just fucking we are back from the tactical difficulties hey. uh laura was saying something very positive to women and non-binary comedians and right. it seems as though god did not well, want I, it said i do want to say that um dan shut off the video and said i i didn't have you here for this kind of stuff right and i was like wow i mean you should put that in yeah, the, yeah in i'm the sorry fine print of the contract that i signed i shot the camera yeah, with a gun <laughs> um so uh laura great having you oh, it was very fun so nice to be here thanks for having me where can people find you uh, find me online, uh, Instagram at Laura Peak Comedy, L A U R A P E E K, um, and then Twitter Laura Peak underscore, mm-hmm. and TikTok is either one of those things, and I can't remember. Please subscribe to the podcast so I can afford uh, air conditioning. That's right. It's yeah. hot. It's hot as shit. Thank you. <laughs>